Good evening, it's Parsha's Bahar. Yesterday we had Pesach Sheni, which was the eternal lesson for Klal Yisrael that it's never too late and everyone has a second chance at doing the right thing. We also know it was the yard site of Reb Meir Balanes, Reb Meir the Tana, who was buried in Tveria, standing up. And he said the reason he was standing, he wanted to be buried standing up, is so that by Trias HaMesim, he wouldn't have to take the extra five minutes to get up, but he would be already in a standing position, able to run out and join Klal Yisrael by Trias HaMesim. We also have this Wednesday night and Thursday is Lagba Omer, and it's in, it's the yard set of Rav Shimon Bar Yochoi, who was one of the five Talmidim, he, Rabbi Yoisi, Rav Meir, Rav Yehuda, that Rabbi Akiva began a new yeshiva after his 24,000 Talmidim were nifter. Someone else would have said, 24,000 Talmidim, I did my best, they all died out and retired. But he didn't. He felt that you have to never look back and you have to look forward with hope and he rebuilt with these five Talmidim who became the backbone, the cementing factor of Klal Yisrael. Rebbeinu HaKadosh was Messiah the Mishnah and put, uh, put it into written form and uh, all of them played a very pivotal role for Klal Yisrael, and we see what Klal Yisrael is today because of his efforts of not giving up. Now, we know that there's a machloikas between Rav Yehuda and Rav Shimon Bar Yochoi about, for instance, Chometz, that by Chometz, Rav Yehuda holds that it must be Burnt. But Shimon Bar Yochoi holds that if you break it up into the tiniest of pieces and you throw it into the air, that that's good also. And we find, in addition, that there's a famous machloikas that if somebody takes a bench or a heavy chair and drags it Shabbos in the sand, so Rabbi Yehuda holds that you're chayiv, because if you're making a charitz, you're making a groove in the sand by pulling the chair, he held that you weren't interested in making the groove, but you made it. So if you made it, you are chayiv. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochoi held, that you're not chayiv and that you're able to, your intention was not a groove, it was just to schlep the chair over to the other place and you ended up making the groove and that's why uh, he held that it was putter. And we find that there's a difference of opinion between the two of them about the vicious animals like the tar tigers and the lions and the scorpions that when Mashiach will come, Rav Yehuda held that they will disappear from the earth. They will be eliminated completely because their whole mission that they were created was to be destructive and the world will be refined and it won't be a destructive world. 
So therefore, he held no, but Rav, Rav Shimon Bar Yochoi held that their nature will change, they will still exist, but their nature will completely change and they won't, a, a, uh, a tiger or lion will eat the straw. They won't destroy animals or people. That's his opinion. So we have three cases that we see that Rabbi Yehuda went with the opinion that we go after the actual action, the Misa, and since you're dragging the chair, that's the Misa and it's happening. Forget about your intention, but you're actually doing that. You're Chayim. And with the Chometz, there's no such thing as just throwing it into the air. You must eliminate it from the world, and that's why it must be burnt. So we see that Rabbi Shema went with machshava, with intention. And his intention wasn't to make a groove. He just had to get the chair over there. But Rabbi Yehuda held, it's not the intention. It's what actually ends up happening. Now, all the chachamim of his time said that he was so big not only there was never a rainbow that appeared in the sky during his life to insinuate and infer that Hashem is so angry with the world that he would really destroy the world, but he promised not to. But he would really destroy the world, but by Rav it never appeared. Because with him in the world, it never would have happened because of his chuz. So all the chachamim of his door said that Yachal Rabbi Shimon liftor as kola ola. The Rabbi Shimon could really potter all of the world because of his tremendous chuz. Now, they ask a question on that. The Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochoi, I mean, is, is being nice. But the fact is, people did the Averis, some of them very severe Averis. So what do you mean that he would have pottered, <coughs> excuse me, he would have pottered the whole world if he had to step in and do it? He could have done it. Why? These people were doing bad. <coughs> but as we spoke the last few minutes, we stress that Rav Shimon Bar Yochoi went after intention. And since a Yid Be'etzen doesn't want to do an Avera, he's overcome by a taiva, by a desire. He sees something that he knows he's not supposed to eat, but he eats it because he couldn't control himself. But deep down, there's a terrible guilt feeling. That means he does it or he does the Misa Taiva, and 10 minutes later he feels bad that he did it, but he just could not. So because in all the three cases that I illustrated for you and explained that the reason for Abshimen in all of those cases was he goes after intention. So if the intention of Yidin is not to do the Averas, and that's his main point that he underscores. That's how he was able to pot to the whole oil of the whole world from all the Averis that they did because he underscored and st stressed the concept of intention over the actual action. Now, tzaddikim, after their nifter, have a much bigger power than when they're here in Olam Hazeh. Because while they are here in Olam Hazeh, they still are subject to the shortcomings of being in a goof, in a body. A body is gashmias, is physical. Of course, we transform our bodies by putting on tefillin, 
we transform the gashmias of our arms to vehicles of mitzvahs with everything that we do. But And as big as they are, they're tzaddikim gemurim. But nevertheless, they're still in a physical body, and that's why the Mekubolim explain that once they're nifter, they divest themselves of that last masho, that last bit of gashmias that they were surrounded by, encompassed within, And they now become 100%, so they can have even a greater effect. So that's the reason. Usually on a yard side, people are pretty sad. They remember a father, a mother passing on, the memories and everything. Many people fast on a yard site. And here on the yard side of Rav Shimon Bar Yochoi, we're busy dancing with music. With, I mean, what, we were so happy that he was nifter, but the answer is that he had the power when he was alive to f exempt the entire world despite the Averis they did. So now that he's in Shemayim, not in a body, how much more he could do for this world. And that's the reason it's a simcha, that he is there uh, fending for Klal Yisrael and putting himself forward to be able to exude every power of Mechila and Slicha and Kapara because he says they never meant to do these Averis, they were against it, but they never were in the quicksand up to their necks. So that's why they did it. He was able to be a much more effective ambassador on behalf of Klal Yisrael from there, as opposed to being here. Now, Parshish Bahar, one of the psukim, after it discusses Shemitah, is Losanu is Esamiso. We have two psukim that are very similar in this, but one is talking about that you're not allowed to cheat your friend. That means when you sell, you see somebody comes in, he has no idea what the, the things cost, and you have an opportunity to cheat him. There's an iser de erisa, and the bus ends via erisa meal kachel because he may not know, and you may get away with overcharging him or cheating him. But you can't get away from me. I know what you did. Hashem says. So that's one Pusik. But then there's another Pusik that says, Am Isser of Onoas Devarim. You're not allowed to say to a Jew hurtful things. It has nothing to do with embarrassing him or saying it in front of 20 people, you can be in the most private place and no one is around to hear you, to see you, and you say to him such, your tongue becomes a razor sharp acid tongue and you can dig into a person without touching him, without taking a a knife or a gun or a stick or a, and hitting him and you're just talking to him but you say such hurtful things that the person is devastated and destroyed and that is the Isr the Arisa of Onoas Devarim so Rabbeinu HaKadosh the Gemara says, and the Medrash talks about it also, says that he made also Suda, he made a festive meal for his Talmidim. And he served them tongue. And from the way the Gemara describes it, 
that he took the soft tongue. Now, I'm not an expert in tongue because I've never tasted tongue, but many people have. And according to this Gemara, there's a soft part, a very delicacy part to the tongue, and there's the peripheral, which is very hard. And that pe So Rabbeinu HaKodesh to Gemara says, had plates of soft tongue and plates of hard tongue. So when the Talmudim went with their plates to take, all of them took from the soft tongue and they did not take from the hard tongue. So Rabbeinu HaKadosh said to them that just like you chose to eat the soft tongue, Make sure your tongue is soft in how you speak and deal with people. And that's why he, what, I mean, it was a very expensive lesson. The Mephorshim even asked, why didn't he just put out a regular meal and give them a drosha about speaking kindly and softly to other people. But the Mephorshim say, because if he would have just said it as a speech, as a drosha, a musr drosha, every Talmud would have thought, he can't be talking about me. I mean, okay, sometimes I say something that's a little sharp. But normally I'm very careful what I say, how I say that. They would exempt themselves and exclude themselves from being under the umbrella of what his speech was meant to be for each and every one of them. But when he actually put out the tongue and they chose the soft over the hard, they couldn't exclude themselves. So when he wanted to make the point that they had to refine their speech level and the quality of the speech in dealing with other people, he had to give an actual concrete example and put out the tongues. And after they left all the hard tongues there and ate all the soft tongues, he could make his point effectively. So say the Mephorshim why he did it and chose uh, this way to be able to bring out his point. Now, the issue of ribis, of paying, or uh, if someone, pay, let's say somebody lends somebody $2,000 and he asks him for interest and he pays the interest. The person who lent is over an Isser de Arisa, and the person who borrowed is over an Isser de Arisa. Yeah, there is a way, there's a Heter Iska and all of that, but I'm speaking just the regular Pasek. And it says that Reb Shimin, Reb Shimin Bar Yochoi, made a statement on that Pasek that Malva Beribis Yoise Shemarchivin Mafsidin more than you make on the deal with the money you made, the charged 5%, 10% interest, you made an extra $300 on this loan. So you made $300, but you lose a lot, lot more. So the Mephorshim explained, and the Kliyokor is very detailed in what he says on this Indian, on this Rab Shimon. The Kliyokor says that when Rab Shimon Bar Yochoi said that you lose more than you gain, so he admitted that you gain some money by charging the interest, but you diminish your emuna. Because when a person opens a regular business, he knows that he has to come into, a, into Hashem. 
there were people that were brilliant and smart and everything, and they never made parnas in their life. They tried this, they tried that, it never happened. Um, and there were people that were at the bottom of their class, and they became multimillionaires, and they were giving tzedakah, supporting yeshivas, and everything. So, because it has nothing to do with brains, it has to do with mazel. Now, the emuna level is heightened when a person realizes he has to come on to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and if he has pure emuna, then there's never a problem. That's what we say in benching. Lower you see, tzadik nezov. Because people have a certain calmness, a peacefulness, serenity that you found by all tzaddikim. If you went in to the Lubavitcher Rebbe, the Satma Rebbe, the, and they didn't have a problem of any money, that's Zoha, Malachto, Nasa, Al Yudea, Cherim, that they were Zoha to have as much support as they needed whenever they needed money. It was at Y because their emuna level was so high that even if something went wrong, they weren't distraught and destroyed. They were in the hands of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and there are things that look like a devastating loss, and there are things that look like a devastate, like a overwhelming success, and it turns out three years later the exact opposite that they had no cushion, they had no death from the success. So the tzaddikim's path was basically one of emun and bitachon. And whatever came across their path, they were in the bosom, in the arms of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and they were very comfortable. HaKadosh Baruch Hu was protecting them, took care of them, and so says the Kli Yoker that all of that, when you lend and borrow with ribis, with interest, it diminishes terribly the power of your emuna. So even if you may gain a little bit of money, that's what Reb Shimon Bar Yochoi meant. He said that you lose more because you're losing out. You can be very happy through life without the worrying, without the frustration, without the devastation, if you put yourselves into the arms of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. But that's only a person who has true emuna. Most people express their, themselves with their emuna, and you have to have emuna, but they're not up to it. It's a, it's a speech, it's words that don't carry with it the power of what real emuna can do and to where it can propel a person to. So that's what the Kliyokar says the Rav Shimon Bar Yochoi meant. Now it says in Chazal that if a person lends someone with interest, he does not stand up by Trias HaMesim. That means when all the dead will stand up from their graves, that he does not stand up out of the grave. So the Mepharshim are very curious. We have worse of it. I mean, lending with interest or borrowing with it is a lot. It's it's serious, but it's a lot of she'en bo ma'isa, and there's no malchus for it. I mean, it's a serious avera, like all averas are, but it's not chil shabbos, and it doesn't say that someone who's a machal shabbos he doesn't stand up by trias ha'meisa. Yet by this it does. And the Mephorshim say a very, very insightful point. 
because who are the people who borrow for, for interest? The desperate ones. They come to someone and they say, if I don't get the $10,000, I'm losing my house, I'm losing my business, I'm the... And they're so desperate for the money that they're willing to pay anything. They're willing to pay whatever. If the guy said originally 5% interest, he said, I changed my mind, I want 10%. This desperate person will pay the 10%. He won't say, well, you first said 5 and now you're saying 10 He won't say that because he needs desperately the money. It's looked at as the worst thing that a human being can do to another human being. That means when somebody is in a desperate situation and you take advantage of that desperation, the Torah is very, very unsympathetic to the person who does that. That there is no level of Rahmanis or pity to the person, person comes, oh, you're going to lose your house? Well, I have $20,000 in the bank. I can't give you the whole twenty, but here's 2000 here. I'm lending you 1000 without interest to help the person, not to squeeze him by the neck. And that is the reason Mepharshim say that all the other Averis, Hashem can tolerate. There's a plus, there's a punishment, there's a gift there's a, for doing mitzvahs and for doing Averis. But when it comes to doing the Avera and choking someone and taking advantage of a situation that you pay eternal price, you don't stand up to Tria Sameis. Now, the Pasuk says that there's Shemitah, and the Pasuk says, V'chisoma manochal v'ashona hashviz v'tzivisi es habrocha l'shlosh shanim. That if someone is living off of his field and then suddenly he's told that Shemitah do nothing, How's he supposed to pay the bills? And that's what the Pasuk asks, if the man says that. So the Pasuk answers that Kurdish Baruch Hu says, I am going to give you a bracha that let's say you make $100,000 in a year. In the sixth year, the year before Shemitah, you're going to make $300,000. $100,000 for that year. For the next year, of Shviyas, and even for the eighth year, because during Shviyas you were not allowed to plant anything. So what's going to happen the year after Shviyas? So the Pasuk says that you're going to get three hundred thousand, triple what you would normally make in a year to cover you for the sixth, the seventh, and the eighth year. Now the Medrash calls these people Giboire Koyach. Giboire Koyach means that they are mighty in their strength. And the Medrash says, what does that mean? It means that they normally would be worried, but the promise of HaKadosh Baruch Hu in their keeping Shemitah, they overcame the Yetzirah, how are you going to live and what are you doing over here? And they kept Shemitah, they're called Kiboyri Koya, that they beat out their Yetzirahs in trying to convince them. But the Mepharshim asked, why should, the Medrash asked, why should they be called Giboy Rekoyach? They're promised by Hashem three years. 
I mean, Hashem, if, if we claim we believe in Him, and He says, I'm giving you three years, whether you're going to get it from some Gavir in America, or like they made this fund for those who keep Shemitah, and they brought them like $40 million from the Gavir, and they distributed it to every farmer hundreds of thousands of dollars because he's keeping Shavias. So then what's the problem? Why are they giboy rekoyach? Like they achieved some unachievable, some unattainable level. Madrega, they have a promise from HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and we see that every year, every Shavias, farmers pull through. Pull through, this way, that way, but they pull through. So the Mephorshim say that the nature of human beings, when a man is sitting by his field and you're not allowed to prune, you're not allowed to work the field, but everything on the field that may grow itself becomes hefter. So a person, an only is allowed to go into the field and take an apple. Now when you see the people coming into your field that you bled and sweat and everything all the years and you can't do anything and they're coming and they're going, that's why they're called Gibari Koyach. That they don't lose themselves in the sea of despair and disappointment in the fact that it's now after people can come and go and take if they need it, if they're on the end. Another thing that they say, and this is really human nature, is that people do not look at the, the past. That means you could have had everything, the big, it, if in the sixth year you got triple, you got 300 tons instead of one, how could you come a year later and look at it, oh, look what's happening, I'm not working my field, and look how much effort I put in to build it up, and now it's Hefker, and now it's up. Because it's, they say, it's not what you did for me yesterday, what have you done for me today? And that is a terrible shortfall of human nature. So that's why they're called Gibari Kraft, because they still keep Shemitah, despite the fact that nothing now is happening for them, and human nature would make them feel at least inside bad and challenged uh, to, to, to think about what's happening. And that's the same thing with all of us, that we have to be constantly reminding ourselves of all the good that was done for us and all of the things that our Kodesh Baruch Hu sent our way. And if now we have a problem, what about the 10 years of good, the 20 years of good? That's non-existent? And that's why they were called the Giburi Prayer, because these thoughts didn't come into their mind. didn't come into their mind at all to lose themselves. Now, there isn't, Rav Yisrael Salanta used to stress that we find in our parsha right after the discussion of Shemitah it delves into a Pasuk says the Chiyomuch Ochicha Umochar Achuzaso. That means Shmita finished and your brother fell on hard times. Hard times. So everyone is troubled. Why does this come right after Shemitah? It's called in English juxtaposition. Like, what's the smicha sapar? Why is this right after that? It's always to teach us something. So, what are we supposed to learn from this? So,
the Mefarshim say one of the Shatim is very, very realistic and down to earth, but hard to achieve. And what they basically say is that after Shemitah, that we had the Amuna people kept Shemitah, they didn't work their fields, and they saw that things worked out, that if somebody came to them that was hard-pressed, they shouldn't say to them, listen, I just got done with Shemitah. What pulled me through? What pulled me through was the unbelievable level of emunah that I was taught to have in Bittachon, and I tried my best to employ to do just that, and that pulled me through. So don't you worry, even though you're about to lose your house and you're about to, don't worry, have Bittachon and Hashem will help. So Rabbi Yisrael Salanta used to say, that that bitachon, that muna, is for yourself. But when a brother comes to you that's fallen on hard times, and he is desperate, you are not allowed to say to him, have a muna and bitachon. And he even uses a word that would be normally not usable for a yid to say, he says you have to become a kofer a denier in HaKadosh Baruch Hu when you're dealing with that person. Because don't give him Musr and don't give him Chizuk. He needs the money. He's fallen on hard times. He's about to lose his house. Take out your checkbook and give him $2,000. Help him. He needs the money. Don't give him the speech. The speech was for yourself. And that's how you pull through Shemitah and you were able to survive because of everything that you said and believed in. And at this point, that's for yourself and the rest of your life, but not for the other. Ayyid puts out his hand and says, I'm in desperate need. You have to help him bottom line. Not with speeches, not musr drushes, and not opinions and eightses. What you need is the bottom line, like the son, the Baal Shem Tov had a son, Tzvi, and a daughter whose name was Odo. Now Tzvi thought that he was supposed to take over for his father. So when his father was Nifter and Shavuos, he went the next week after the Shiva and he sat in his father's seat. By the first yard site, a year later, his father came to him and said, my dear son, it was not meant for you. It's meant for the Mizritcha Magad. And what you should do is stand up and trade seats. He should be sitting at the head of the table and you should be sitting where he's sitting. He didn't question or ask anything. And he got up and he switched places, and then for the next 11 years, the Mizritcha Magad was the leader of the Chevraya. But this Tzvi, the son, he did a very rich Shidduch. And he gave out money and spent, he was somebody needed, he was so lavish and so generous. And it came to a point, and his father already was nifter. The Baal Shem Tov was not here in Olam Hazem. And he, he went around to his father's Talmidim. And he told them, I'm out of money, and now I am so used to giving and doing. I became called Moichen de Katnes. He became limited in his expansiveness. He couldn't be. So he went from 
Talmud and Chosid of his father one by one. This one gave him this advice, and this one gave him this bracha, and this one. And he came to Reb Pinchas Koritzer, and Reb Pinchas Koritzer asked him, are you able to stay here for two days? So he said, yes. And Reb Pinchas Koritzer disappeared. And Reb Tzvi was in Reb Pinchas Koritzer's house waiting for him to return. Two days later, he showed up with two sacks of gold. And he said to him, I took one look at your face and I saw you didn't need brachas, you didn't need Eitz's advice, you desperately needed money, the bottom line. So we, I didn't even have a discussion with you, I just went out to my sources and I'm back with two sacks of gold for you to be able to continue your expansive posture. So that fits in with this word that when a yid comes for help, forget the chizak, forget the discussion, he needs help, that's the bottom line. Give him a check, give him some money, and that's what he needs, and that's what he needs to leave from you. Um, the Svasemes says that the Medrash says that the reason that the base of Mikdash was destroyed was for two reasons, Sinas Chinam, as we know, and the second reason was that they didn't properly keep Shemitah. So the, he asks, what does Shemitah have to do with... So he answers and says that Beis HaMikdash was a unifier. It had a unifying effect. Vayichan Shom Yisrael Negeda Har Ish Echad Balev Echad. And Shemitah also had a unifying effect because of the fact that it brought the people together. They were in it together. They were giving up their lands. They were not working the lands. They didn't know how they would eat and what would happen. So he unified Klal Yisrael. So the Svat Semit says because the period of Sinas Chinam and the Bittel of Shemitah, which was a unifier, that brought about Nebuch, uh, the, the Chorban. Now, he goes on to explain that Klal Yisrael, during Shemitah, it was an equalizer, just not a unifier. Meaning that somebody could have been a big farmer, he made a million dollars a year, and now suddenly he was not doing anything. So it brought the people, I mean, they went back to avoid this Hashem, they were busy, what did they do the whole year? They were stronger in the given areas. But the point being that when we have to grow, we shouldn't wait for something which would pull us down to open up a tillum or to give tzedakah. We should be doing it without it because during Shemitah it says it was an equalizer and a unifier. And because they were weak in their Shemitah observance in their Israel, that contributed to the Chorban base of Migdash, which also was the power of helping Kal Yisrael to cement those relationships. Now, it's interesting that when it came here, there were thousands dying every day or at least hundreds and hundreds, and it came Lag Omer, and not one died. Suddenly, like an abrupt end, and then Lag Omer, that
that there was this power of the day that brought it together. But as I said to you last week, that the word covered is the Gematria 32, and it means the 32 Nesiva Sachachma, that they couldn't reach it, and that's why they were Nifter, because Rabbi Akiva was higher, and he wanted to bring all of his Talmidim up to that level. But when the Lamed Beis Nesiva Sachachma finished the 32 days from the beginning of Sphere up until that point, so then the Gezeira, they saw, and it was Rav Shimon Bar Yochoi with having introduced Kabbalah to the world and written the Zohar HaKadosh and these things that brought that schus about and that they were able to to have that unbelievable effect for Klal Yisrael and the dying stopped in an instant moment because the Lamed Beis, the Siva Sachachma, the 32 days of Chachma, which was the level that Rabbi Akiva wanted to get them to, was effectively completed, and that's why not another one. You would think that if 600 died the day before and 300 the day before that, that at least the next day it, there would be 10 that would die, that 20, there would be something. But it stopped on a split dime. It stopped altogether because it was able to bring out. And that's the reason why we cut children's hair. Many do it on Lag Omer. Because Rabbi Akiva darshan all the tagging, which look like little hairs on top of the letters. And they're called sa'aros hairs. So therefore there's a minig to cut the hair on Lagba Omer and we don't cut the hair the whole time. Because hair is a unique like in the Ulamat Sea is there's no there's there's nothing it's different than the other three Ulamas of Asiya, Yitzira and Bria. And that's why it corresponded to so much that we don't take haircuts during Sira, and it comes like Bom where we all do take haircuts, and that's why we take the, the, the hair off the heads of the children who have not had the thing. Because hair is the only physical item that has no feeling. That means if somebody goes up to you and punches you, you'll feel the pain in the arm. But if somebody cuts or cuts on skin, they'll feel terrible pain. But when they cut the hair, you don't feel anything. There's no pain to it. Because it's already in the realm of Lamed Beis Nesiva Sachochma. And that's why it's untouchable that even Begashmi is, that there is no hair gush, there is no feeling. So anyway, these are very holy days, and the hoiben, they're very elevated days, and that a person is able to hone out and to bring out the best of the midos each and every day through the tzinor created by the fact that we have Sirius Omer, and each and every year when he comes to the simcha of Rav Shimon Bar Yochoi, of Lagba Omer, that he is mashpia for from where he is, Yacho Liftor es Kolha Oilam Kulo, he's able to be a magnificent ambassador, goodwill ambassador on our behalf in the fullest way that we could never reach. And that he is able to do it. That's why we're misameach with him on his yard site. Afrelech and lagba oimer to each and every one. And that the Abish is a health and that Parshish Bahar has the Shemitah and all the Yoivel. And Yoivel is com- comparable to Yom Kippur, which brings a kapara for all of Kla Yisrael. 
the Shalah HaKadosh once asked his Talmidim, which is bigger, Yom Kippur or Shabbos? And they all answered Shabbos, because you have seven aliyahs, and if someone's Mechal Shabbos, it's a Chiyam Misa. But Yom Kippur is just a Chiyam Chorus, and there's only six aliyahs. So the Shalah HaKadosh said wrong that Yom Kippur is Keneged Yoivo and Shabbos is Keneged Shemitah. The reason that the punishment is less is because it's such a day of Slicha, Mechila, and Kapara that it's even reflected at the level of the punishment that it is knocked down a notch. So Lagba Omer always comes out right around Bahar, Bahar Bechukosai, that these are centers that deal with Geula. Geula Tiya La'oritz, the Pasuk says in this week's Parsha. And the fact that we have um, Yoivel over here, the source of Yoivel is from this Parsha, that Yoivel is when everyone goes out L'cheiris, a remez to the days of Geula, Mashiach, and that we will be able to rejoice and dance together with everyone as a unified force as Claudius Yisrael.